Protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah Baba. Protector of the Sunnah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله we are together once again going on this wonderful and this beautiful journey talking about our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um kind to kind of not necessarily go all the way back like we've been doing starting from the beginning we'll just kind of do like a review from last week and last week we talked about uh, the call it was called the battle of ahzab this is a confederacy that the quraish um a bunch of arab uh, tribes um and and the jews all of them were um bent on destroying islam this was a defensive position for the first time that the muslims had to deal with with the enemy coming to basically the doorsteps of medina and subhanallah our beloved companion um uh, salman al farisi who was a persian had introduced to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the art of digging a trench around the part of medina that was uh, uh could be considered weak and uh they were betrayed by the Jews and an individual a famous sahaba who had accepted Islam secretly had came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and devised a plan of distrust between the Jews between the Ghatafan and between um the Quraysh and alhamdulillah the Quraysh end up going back leaving um Medina and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam basically stated that he would not be in a position where he would allow anybody to come into Medina again now the muslims would be in a or uh, a a uh, a position of attacking the enemy instead of waiting this so would be more offensive than defensive um after the threat from the quraish pretty much was over with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that for him not to put his sword down until they reached the gates of Banu Quraida. Banu Quraida was a Jewish tribe that acknowledged a treaty between the Muslims at one time and then they ended up betraying the Muslims and um our beloved um Saad ibn Muayth had come with a verdict because he used to be their ally in the days of ignorance before Islam and they thought that he was going to come up with something that would be light based upon the fact that they had a history with each other and it was ordered that the men should be killed and that the women and children <clears throat> were taken as captives and so alhamdulillah this leads us up to today's class uh military activities that continued after ahzab so like i stated before the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was done being on the defensive he was not ever going to try and make a situation where a uh, enemy would come to the doorsteps of Medina. And so um after the battle of Azab there was a person by the name of Salam bin Abi al uh, Huqaiq and he was a Jew and he was another Jewish criminal that had been aiding and abetting the Quraysh um in the battle of Azab by giving them supplies and wealth and food and he hated the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so when the Muslims had settled the affair with Banu Quraida um the Khazraj tribe who was a rival of Al Aus in the times of Jahiliya or the times of ignorance or before they had become Muslim they wanted permission to kill this and this uh criminal now the Aus were responsible for getting the person Kab ibn Ashraf and so they wanted to kind of make up for not being able to get uh this individual so they were like look aus killed that this enemy of islam messenger of allah allow us to be able to put a hit out on this person who has been aiding and abetting their our enemies 
and saying vicious things about you and about Islam. And so Alhamdulillah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave them permission to do this. So it says that uh, a person by the name of Abdullah bin Atik, um, he headed for Khaybar. And remember what we talked about before, that the Jews did not like live amongst the Muslims all like that. They lived in Medina, but they lived in far distant areas and they have like fortresses. And so Abdullah, he goes to um, this fort and he says that when he approached the place, he advised the men. So he took like, uh, I think it was like five people he took with him. So he advised them to stay a little bit behind so he wouldn't draw any type of attention. And so he goes and he says, like, look, I'm going to disguise myself in a cloak. And then what he did, he act like he was relieving himself. And so when it was time for the people to go into the fort, the individual who was the gatekeeper thought that he was part of their people. So he told him, like, look, hurry up and come in. We're getting ready to close the door. So they closed the fort. And so he. So he goes inside. Now he's inside. SubhanAllah. He didn't have to break in. He didn't have to climb any walls. They basically invited him in. So he gets invited in and, and he waited till it got dark. And he finds this criminal and he basically puts him to the sword. So he kills him. And in between, he, he must have been running. Maybe he tripped. He fell in the midst of trying to get away and he fractured his leg. And so what he did, he hid in a place until the morning time came. And it said that uh, <laughs> he was waiting for them to announce that the person had got that was dead. So when he heard that, he ends up leaving out. They open up the fortress. He ends up escaping out of there. He goes back to the Prophet Wasallam, who listened to the whole story. And Alhamdulillah, through a miracle, um, the Prophet Wasallam wiped the fracture on his, uh, his leg. And he was healed right on the spot from that. And so like we were talking about before, remember when people were trying to say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never performed any miracles. And this is another miracle that he performed where this is some places that he broke his leg, but he probably he fractured it. He messed it up. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam healed his leg right on the spot. So shortly after the conclusion of the, uh, the Confederates and, and fighting battle Quraidah, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he started to dispatch um, expeditions in an aggressive manner. So all of those Arabs that were rebellious around Medina, that still was trying to cause them a problem a little bit, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the offensive. And so he would send platoons in order to deal with these people. And Alhamdulillah, our hero and the Knight of Islam, um, Muhammad Ibn Maslama, was dispatched on military miss uh, a military missions and they headed for the uh habitation of Bani Bakr. So this was a offset Bani Bakr was a huge tribe. So this is an offset of Bani Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has sent Muhammad Ibn Maslama to go and deal with the situation. So when they go there, they go and they they conquer the particular area. A lot of spoils fell to the Muslims. And there was an individual they ended up catching who was a horrible disbeliever. His name was Thumama bin Uthal uh, al Hanafi. And he was a chief of Bani Hanafi. Now, I'm sorry, Banu Hanifa. And subhanAllah, now who else is in charge of Banu Hanifa? The notorious Musaylama. And Musaylama actually sent Thumama, or he was trying to send people in order to assassinate the Prophet. And so in terms of Islamic history is concerned, um, he was a person who claimed to be a prophet. And during the time of Abu Bakr, this individual gave the Muslims a run for their money. And a lot of the Muslims had ended up dying in these, they called it the apostasy wars. And um, Musaylama was somebody who was not a lightweight person um, to, to deal with. The Muslims had a, a great fitna in terms of dealing and killing him, you know, but he, this individual was from, from Musaylama's tribe and he hated the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they bring him back in this, this particular raid or this battle, the, the Muslims are successful, they bring this individual back and they know his hatred for Islam. 
So the Prophet وسلم, had the companions tie him up to a pole in the mosque. So uh, to a question posed by the Prophet وسلم, Thumama, he used to say, if you were to kill someone, then you would have to choose one of noble descent. If you were to be gracious, then it would be a grateful man. And if, if you were to ask for money, and if you, uh, you would have to ask it from a generous man. And he said he repeated that three times on three different occasions. On the third time, the Prophet Wasallam ordered that he should be released. And soon after, he went, uh, he washed himself. He came back and he professed his faith in Islam. Alhamdulillah. He says that no face was more awful to me than your face. And now there is not a face that is more dear to me than your face. Alhamdulillah. So it says that um, he ends up going to Umrah and he swore to the people that they wouldn't get a, a nothing, a, a grain of nothing. You understand that would uh, come to them unless the Prophet Wasallam said so. So think about why do you think that the Prophet Wasallam tied him up in the pillar of the masjid? He could have put him in like a prison that they had, but he tied him up in the in the uh, in the masjid in the pole. And Subhanallah, this once again is the genius of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know they they not dumb where they are about to let somebody who hates the Messenger of Allah roam around free. So he tied him up, and this is so this individual can see the behavior of the Muslims. He saw they kept him. He, he was kept for a certain amount of time. So from Farja, Zuhur, Asr, Makrib, Isha, he sees the solidarity. He sees the sincerity. He sees the brotherhood and he's watching this. So all of the fears that he may, all of the hatred or the, the stereotypes that he may have had about Islam, it ends up going out of the window. And Alhamdulillah, he ends up going to make Umrah and he tells them that, now he's a Muslim. They had accused him of being an apostate. And he said, I wasn't an apostate. I accepted Islam. And he told him that you wouldn't get a grain from your mama. This is the place that he's from. And unless the Prophet Wasallam interceded on his behalf, which actually the Prophet Wasallam did intercede because the Meccans ended up having some uh, like a drought. They had a, a famine that hit them. And the Muslims had helped SubhanAllah, the messenger of Allah had sent some um, aid, you know, to them in this situation. So there was another situation from Bani, uh, this is called Bani Lihyan uh, uh, invasion. So Bani Lihyan had uh, acted treacherously towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they captured 10 of the companions of the Prophet and they actually hung them. And so they, they're, um, habitation or the, the dwelling was deep into the Hijaz and it was on the borders of Mecca. So this is like kind of territory that the Muslims is, has, haven't really uh, messed around with. And um, so he's looking at the situation where you have this deep-seated revenge um, between the Muslims and then they've got the Quraysh as an issue and the other Arabs that might hate the Muslims as well. And so the Prophet Wasallam was like, nah, this is kind of going too much deep into their territory. And, um, you know, that's something that he really necessarily wasn't trying to do. But 200 Muslim fighters, and they headed for Syria. So they end up going in that direction, and then they changed route. And they went to route, they went to, route uh, uh, to the scene where the companions had gotten hung. And he had invoked Allah's mercy on them. And the news had traveled that the Muslims were coming. And that particular tribe immediately had fled to the mountaintops. And uh, the Muslims weren't necessarily able to get them in that particular situation. But it was around eight other battles and skirmishes that happened even after that. And subhanAllah, you know, brothers and sisters, we really see the resolve of the Muslims during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's like they never almost had a break. They were continuously, the, the mental part, either they were uh, on the defense or they were on the offense. 
They had all of these obstacles and these people around them that hated them. And so therefore their whole thing was like, look, you know, we're in a position um, that we constantly are fighting people. <laughs> they fighting people. They've lost people. They've been uh, um, betrayed, you know, for people who supposed to be Muslim been betrayed by them. So they constantly, the type of Iman, the kind of faith that they had is unmatched. And now we understand why the Prophet Sallallahu said that the Sahaba is the best generation that Allah ever created. Now we understand and we see why. You know, power makes people corrupt. They were getting all kinds of power. They were getting all kinds of things that was coming to them and they ended up being successful, alhamdulillah. And it didn't make them arrogant. It only make them, made them more humble. And um, alhamdulillah, because of that behavior, because of that, that dawah from their personality, that you had people who hated the messenger of Allah now love the messenger of Allah. They love being Muslim now, now that they are in the hands of Islam in a good way. So there's another situation, Banu, uh, Bani al-Mustalik, and it reached the news. Uh, this news reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the second of Shaban. And uh, the chief of Banu Mustalik, his name was Al-Harith uh, bin Dirar. And he was talking about making a large force to attack Medina. So like we said before, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not having that. Nobody is attacking Medina. He's not with that. That's the end of that. Boom. And so what happens is that uh, Buraida bin al-As uh, uh, Hasib was immediately dispatched in order to verify the reports because they would hear things. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wanted to make sure that it was true in order not to go on, on rumor and any innocent person um, would be, be hurt. Um, so he's, they sent somebody to do recognizance. This is the Kufar. They sent somebody to do recognizance on the Muslims and the Muslims caught that person and he killed him. And so the Prophet Sallallahu he summoned his men and he ordered them to prepare for war. And before he left Zayd ibn Haritha, he used to be his adopted son. He left him in charge of Medina. And Alhamdulillah, this is another intelligent thing that the Prophet Sallallahu would do. So when they would go out on these different missions, he's leaving leadership to different Sahabi. So number one, now that they get an opportunity to see how to govern people, they're responsible for leading the Salah. They're responsible to make sure that there's no injustice going on. And Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, who was blind, a lot of times was left in charge of Medina when the Muslims would go out and fight. And so this is, uh, this is it's wonderful. This is great thinking on the part of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, this is what he would do. So on hearing the advent of the Muslims, that it said that the disbelievers got frightened and the Arabs going with them defected and ran away for their lives. So once again, the Muslims is coming and they the Muslims rush and engage with the enemy in the battle. And the Muslims, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them victorious. And it said some men and uh, men, some men were killed. Um, women and children and disbelievers was taken as uh, captives. And a lot of the war spoils came to the Muslims. So it was 200 families that was taken captive, 200 camels, 5,000 sheep, uh, goats, 5,000 sheep and goats, as well as a huge quantity of household goods, which were captured as spoils as well. The household goods were sold in auction to the highest bidder. Only one Muslim was killed, and that was by mistake. An Ansari killed him by mistake. These things happen in war. And so... It wasn't, um, this was not like a major situation of uh, like Uhud and the Battle of Badr. The Muslims engaged them and the people um, sound like they gave up because the Muslims had them outnumbered and this is what ended up happening. So amongst the captives was Jawaria and this he, she was the um, daughter of uh, the chief of this, of Banu Mustalik. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he married her. And the Muslims had manumitted 200 um, or manumitted 100 others of the enemy prisoners who had embraced Islam and were called then the Prophet's in-laws. And so Alhamdulillah, this is something that I've seen before. 
and other stories is that they felt bad having captives who were now relatives basically through marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And Alhamdulillah, um, and we'll talk about this um, in a minute when he uh, married Zainat Ibn Jash and a accusation that the Kufar tried to use against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the treacherous role of the hypocrites prior to Banu Mustalik um, battle, the enemies of Islam, of course, we talked about was always trying to stir up um, discourse. And so for five years, they were trying to do this. And they came to realize that the way and exterminating Islam physically was not necessarily going to work. They tried in the Battle of Badr, it didn't work. They tried in the Battle of Uhud, it didn't work. All of the battles between uh, after Uhud, then they tried the situation in the Battle of um, uh, Handak or the Trench or Al Ahzab, then that didn't work. Then they tried to do the go with the Battle Quraida, that didn't work. And then all of these other enemies that were speaking ill of Islam and talking and trying to plot against Islam, the Muslims had annihilated them. So they're looking like, you know what? We obviously, we can't beat them a physical situation. So what most people try to do is they try to stir up fitna or they try to cause an issue um, with words. They try to have dissension. This is something that's well known. You know, uh, they were used to, uh, during the time of the Black Panther movement, they used to write letters um, to other Black figures saying that this Black figure said something ill about them in order to cause discourse and disunity amongst these particular groups, okay? And so this is the same tactic that the Munafikin were trying to um, trying to do. So anybody who is tuning in for the first time, Munafikin were individuals who had accepted Islam outwardly with their mouth, but it was not in their heart. And they were extremely unhappy that the Muslims were there and they wanted things to go back to the way that they were. And they did everything in their power behind the Muslims back in order to thwart the uh, Islam. Okay. And so they want, they started, uh, started dealing with stuff with rumors and, um, the Prophet Sallallahu married Zainab bin Jahash. Now, why is that controversial? It's controversial because Zainab used to be married to Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, who is Zayd ibn Haritha? Zayd ibn Haritha was the adopted son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So during times of Jahiliyyah, the times of ignorance and before Islam, during that time, it would be reprehensible for a father to marry the ex-wife of his son. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had cleared up that adopted sons are not, they're not just sons. They're not biologically by blood, they're sons. And so this tradition was being broke that they used to have as it related to an adopted son and a person who adopted him and, um, and marrying this individual. On top of that, Zainab was, was the Prophet Sallallahu fifth wife. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran that we're only allowed to mar marry up to four women? And so now they're using this and saying, oh, you know what? He married, this is the fifth person that he married. This is a special allowance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only gave to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, I want you to think about something. A lot of these marriages were uh, marriages that in terms of political reasons and some of them, because that's an excuse that people like to use as the only reason why the Prophet Sallallahu practiced polygyny. He used these marriages a lot of times in terms of bringing people together. And I want to use a modern example that we may be able to relate to. Imagine if you had, uh, there's popular gangs that exist. We know about the Bloods and we know about the Crips. We know about uh, another popular gang is the Latin Kings. Um, you have the Vice Lords, the Blackstone Rangers, or El Rukin now. These, imagine if these tribes or these gangs was around Medina or in Medina, or in around Me in Mecca, Medina. 
imagine if somebody prominent from Bloods son married somebody prominent's daughter from the from the Crips, and they had started having children. What happens is is that you are less likely to have violence because now there's something at stake. There's lives, there's somebody who's going to be affected. Do a person loves his daughter, individual loves his son, and now there's children involved. The likelihood of these mass killings, mass fitna, now is at is going to start lowering. And so the Prophet Sallallahu would do things in order to break taboos. It relates to the old understanding, the jahiliya, the kufar way of understanding, and also these marriages served as a, a, a purpose um, politically as well in terms of bringing people in together. And because he, and, and he, might, and he wanted to marry him. That's the other thing. You understand? So this is why, in case somebody has this question as to why he was permitted to do this, this is only something in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do. Okay? So... The rumors um, had a negative impact on the morale of some weak-hearted Muslims until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came with a verse from the Quran and it says, O Prophet, Audu Billahi min shaitan regime, O Prophet, keep your duty to Allah and obey not the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Do not follow their advice. Verily, Allah is ever all knower and all wise. Okay? So that's how that was dealt with. And so it said that they were able they were uh, able to create discord with Muslims themselves and uh, came up with some real ugly uh, slander against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala revealed another verse in the Quran: Had they marched out with you, they would have added uh, to you nothing except disorder, and they would not uh, have hurried about you in your midst spreading corruption and so and sedition among you. Alhamdulillah. Now, this is something too. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed things to happen in order to distinguish the good from the bad. Because sometimes when everything is going great, everything is going good, the bad people are able to hide in the shadows. It's not until something bad happens and then sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then reveals individuals real mindset intentions in their heart okay and so you have people who may not have necessarily believed like they should have believed in their um slander against the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ends up coming out and so now they end up being more exposed because remember the, the muslims didn't know who the munafikeen were they were hidden you understand? So they didn't know who they were. This could be somebody you go to, you see a Jumu all the time. They come to the masjid and they hate Islam. And this is what they used to do. Allah said they would come to prayer, but they would come in a lazy state. You understand? Like they didn't want to be bothered. Man, let's get this over. They would be like that. So a lot of times, and people could talk good game. And so Allah would let things happen that looked unfavorable to the Muslims and only it was a blessing in disguise because what it was doing was showing those who were not down with you. And that is invaluable. It's the worst thing in the world. One of the worst things in the world to feel that you have somebody in your corner who really hates your guts. <laughs> so Allah allowed for these things to happen in order to disseminate those or to separate those who were down and those who were not. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about these types of things. And even to the point where it's good uh, in the battle of Uhud, it was good that they withdrew because imagine if they stayed in the battle and they would have went back and forth in the ranks, causing dissension and discord and, and confusion in the hearts of those who was good Muslims. And they might've listened to them. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophets, tells us, he reveals in the Quran this situation that they would have spread corruption and sowed sedition among the Muslims. So alhamdulillah. So a quarrel was about to break out between the immigrants and the helpers, mashallah. That the muhajirs who were from Mecca, 
was getting ready to get into it with the with the Ansar. Because the Munafikin were from Medina, right? So there was a situation that this thing came out, it caused a problem, and then they were about to get into it. And the Prophet Sallallahu immediately quoted and said, listen, this misbehavior is like times of Jahiliyyah. We don't do that. We Muslim. We don't do that. We're not doing that. So he put an end to that immediately. And because they love the Prophet Sallallahu and Islam so much, they immediately stopped and they hear, they heard, and they obey. So Abdullah Ibn Ubay, of course, this is the chief of the, the hypocrites, um, uh, was furious for the challenge that the Muslims showed towards the hostile plans and intrigues roving behind closed doors. So he's mad because every single thing that he's ever tried to do, it's basically backfired. So um, Umar <laughs> had asked did the Prophet Wasallam, could he kill him? Because it's, it's now, it's just like, you know what? His stuff is way, it's out in the open now. He, from the time that the Prophet Wasallam came, he um, was hostile and disrespectful. So he would do things like be nice and then be disrespectful at the same time. And the top zero so to Hujurat, there was a situation where the Prophet Wasallam came on a donkey and um, Abdullah Ibn Ubay had made some snide remark to the Prophet Wasallam, some disrespectful comment and uh, a sahaba said it's something about get this offensive smell away from us you know and then the one of the sahaba said that the donkey smell better than you do and then it ended up being a thing where they jumped up and was getting ready to get into it then so this is in the early part so he's always just they seeing his behavior from point A to point B, to point C, to the point where Omar says this about him because he makes a comment. He says the most, on this is Abdullah Ibn Ubay. He said, the most honorable will expel the meanest out of Medina. So he's talking about the Muslims. They, the Muslims have outnumbered and shared uh, us in our land. If you fatten your dog, it will eat you. Okay. So basically, if they let him stay without issue, they're going to be they're going to be gone. So this is a, a very um, nasty way of talking about the Muslims, right, in terms of getting rid of them. And so Umar heard this. He said, messenger of Allah, let me kill this dude. Um, we, I mean, we sick of this guy. Let's let me kill him. And so the Prophet of the Lord, he said, listen, um, I'm not going to let you do that because we don't need people coming back and saying that Muhammad is killing his followers. So this is a very wise um, decision on the, prophet, on the part of the Prophet Wasallam because people don't know exactly, a lot of times they don't know the inner workings of a, of a organization. So it might be all kind of stuff going and people on the outside, they see something different. The people on the inside know what's going on. The people on the outside uh, don't know. So imagine if Omar would have killed him it would have came out that he was killed, that this person was a, a so-called Muslim. He killed him. So imagine if somebody was thinking about becoming Muslim and uh, it just would have been, a, it's a bad public relations situation. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, lie, you know, we're not going to do that, you know, um, because of this particular reason. So what happens, um, Omar announced his departure. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he sent uh, Omar out and it said that they marched for two days until the sun grew hot. Now, this is a great move because tensions was high based upon this situation we just talked about with Zainab and the Saha and the, the Ansars and the, the, um, the uh, Muhajirs, the immigrants getting into it. So it's almost like, look, man, I got you on. A, I got a mission, you know, going out to this mission. And then they just keep on going. And then all of the, 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 the problems that they had with each other is now, subhanAllah, is squashed. You know, it's gone. They probably went out there. They talking on this journey. It grew hot. And then they stopped it. They stopped it, whatever like that. And alhamdulillah, um, this was something that helped. They stopped and they fell asleep. And um, this diverted uh, people's attention from the previous event. So once again, this is another wonderful tactic 
that the Prophet Sallallahu used in order to stop any type of madness from furthering, uh, going uh, further in uh, between the Muhajirs and the Ansars. So Alhamdulillah, Abdullah ibn Ubay's son, he heard of what his father in the party that, uh, that was with him um, was doing when he reached Medina. So it said that he drew his sword. Now this is his son. He drew his sword and he barred his father from entry into Medina and said until he confessed and declared that he himself was the meanest citizens of Medina and that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most honorable in Medina. Okay. And um, he said that he would cut his Abu's head off. <laughs> so he was ready to kill his father because of the stuff that he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So of course we know that that didn't happen. And um, Alhamdulillah, you know, but the point is, is that this person's son loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so much that he was upset that his father would even say something um, about the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So our last thing that we're going to talk about is the slander affair. For those who are not familiar with this, in Surah to Ahzab, which I encourage everybody to read because it is a, in that surah, there are etiquettes in Islamic law in terms of dealing with the situation that we're getting ready to deal with. So after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was turning from Banu Mustalik, uh, the Muslim army had halted in a place a short distance from Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife, Aisha, was with him. Somebody asked me one time in another class, did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wives travel with him um, during, uh, in terms of battle sometimes? So yes, the answer is yes, because we have proof that Aisha Radata Anha had went on this mission dealing with Banu Mustalik, okay? And so it says that um, she dropped a necklace and the necklace wasn't, of great value, but it was a loan from a friend of hers. So she went out and searched for this necklace. And on her return, she realized that the army had marched away. Now, how could that, how can that happen? So on the camels, what used to happen is they used to have this, uh, it would be this uh, kind of like a tent almost on the camel. And the women would be in this tent on top of this camel. And so they thought that she was in there. And um, this is how they ended up leaving her because they had assumed that she was already in there. Aisha Relata Anha was very, she was young, she was very thin, and she was very lightweight. So it was easy to believe that she was in that, um, in, um, in that uh, particular thing, or whatever they call it. I want to say call it a hold, but I don't think that's the name of it. But if it, it puts you on a mindset of like a tent, almost on top of a camel that the woman, women being in, maybe children would be in there too. But they thought she was in there and obviously nobody saw her leave from up out of there and she's going and looking for this necklace. So it said that she cried until she went to sleep. And there were uh, a Sahaba named Safwan. One of the things that they would do, the tactics that they would use is that somebody would, would kind of leave far behind specifically for this type of reason. So somebody would be far behind, the army would go, somebody might be really far behind to, to, uh, in terms of the uh, picking up on the tail end to make sure that everything, somebody might be lost, something might have happened, somebody can, they can report something, so on and so forth. So Safwan, he sees Aisha Relata Anha, and this is before the verse came about, uh, about the veil, about veiling. And so he recognized her. He had her get on his camel and didn't say not one word to her. He didn't talk to her. He didn't say nothing to her. He was quiet the whole time they went into Medina. So subhanAllah, when this happens, the hypocrites and led by Abdullah ibn Ubay, they came up with this scandal. Basically, you all know what they accused her of with this brother. So it says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had held counsel with his companions, and he pronounced an incident, and it arose, uh, it roused fighting between two factions, the Aus and the Khazraj. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi intervention in silenced them both. So now this, this 
bond was in jeopardy because of this situation. Because I don't, I can't remember uh, who Abdullah Ibn Ubay, what tribe he was a part of. I can't remember if he was either Aus or Hazraj. But this situation had jumped off. And this rumor was going around. And Aisha Rilata Anha didn't even know that this was going on. So it says that she fell ill and was confined to, for, to her bed for a month. So she was devastated that somebody would bring a rumor about her doing something immoral like that. So it says on recovering that she heard the slander and she took permission to go see her parents and seek an authentic news. And it says that she burst into tears and she stayed for two days and one sleepless night ceasingly weeping to such an extent that it felt that her liver was getting ready to burst open. Okay. It said that her, she felt that her liver was about to bust open. And um, so you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he goes and he sees her and, you know, he basically tells her that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you're innocent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will acquit you. And, um, and if you're not, then you should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg for his mercy um, and forgiveness and, and, and pardon. And so it said that she stopped weeping. And she asked her parents to speak for her, but they couldn't, they didn't have nothing to say. And um, she said, should I tell you that I'm innocent and Allah knows that I am surely innocent, you will not believe me. And if I were to admit to something which Allah knows I'm innocent, you will, you will believe me. Then I will have to do and make recourse to accept the words of our father Yusuf. And he quotes a verse from the Quran. So this shows the scholarship of Aisha Rilata Anha. She quotes a verse from the Quran where it says, "Audo billahi min shaitan rajim." So for me, patience is most fitting, and it is Allah alone whose help can be sought against that which you assert. Subhanallah. So she's relying on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So it says that she turned away and she laid down for some rest, and at the decisive moment, the revelation came acquitting Aisha of the most slanderous talk fabricated in this concern. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, verily those who brought forth the slander um, against the wife of the Prophet sallallahu are a group among you. And so Allah uses the word slander. Alhamdulillah. Now, a little offshoot of this. The Prophet sallallahu is asking people about Aisha's character. And this really speaks on the character of the Sahaba because what could have happened? What could have other wives had said? Other wives could have said, you know what? Yep, she's no good for you, messenger of Allah. You should divorce her. Somebody else who might have had some issue with her could have said, said could have lied and said something. And <laughs> Ali was asked about her. And this is something that Aisha read out to Anha kind of held on to for a very long time after the death of the Prophet he basically said, listen, you know, you are the messenger of Allah. And basically you can have whoever you want to. And she got really upset about that and never forgot about it. And she, he asked Usama, Usama spoke highly of Aisha Rilata Anha. Then he asked one of the, um, the other one of the, the, uh, the wives and she had nothing but good to say about Aisha Rilata Anha. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings this verse clearing Aisha Raylata Anha of any type of immoral wrongdoing. So the principal people who were fueling this um, slander, the person by the name of Mista, another person named Hassan, and another person named Hamna, and they were flogged with 80 stripes. So what is the punishment in Islam for lying on somebody, right? <laughs> We do this so much, so easy. If people got their behind whooped for the stuff that they did in terms of lying on somebody about something, we wouldn't have necessarily this problem. Number one, if you accuse somebody of something, you're supposed to have witnesses to it. So in Islam, if you slander somebody, the punishment is supposed to be 80 lashes. That's the, that's the punishment for that. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, revealed in this surah that there's other elements to it that 
um, there was a, a Sahaba and his um, and his wife, whom when that when they heard this news, they put the best spin on it. And Alhamdulillah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala praised them for that mode of thinking. That when this came to you, why didn't you put the best spin on it? This is not no. I don't believe that. Where's your proof of that? How do you know that that's true? No, 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 no. No, but people, they love gossip. They love slander. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters in Islam, you have to be very careful about that. If you slander somebody, you end up losing out on your deed, your good deeds. And if you don't have any more good deeds, then you end up getting, they start taking a person's bad deeds that you slander. So this is something that we have to be very careful of. It's not lightweight. We have to maintain and watch our tongues as it relates to um, uh, talking about things or lying about people's character or lying about something that we don't have any proof of. And as a result of it, these people got beat. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe one day, inshallah, we can go into the top set or so to Azab. It's a very, um, uh, that in um, Surah Al-Nur has a lot of laws as it relates to this, uh, the societal laws um, in, in Islam, okay? So we got to be very careful about doing this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he has asked about paradise and he said, if you protect in terms of these things, and he talked, to, he held his tongue and he said, there's nothing more uh, that can get somebody in the hellfire than what come out of their mouth, okay? And then he talked about between a person's um, hips and they jawbone, you understand that you have to be careful what you do with those. Okay. So, alhamdulillah, uh, almost a month later, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes to Umar al-Khattab and they were engaged in talking. And he said, don't you see, Umar, if I had him, if, he, if you killed Abdullah ibn Ubay, a large number of dignitaries would have furiously hastened to fight for him. So now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is thinking, that's the other part. Abdullah ibn Ubay had a lot of people behind him, right? They're trying to have a unified Medina. So if this individual, he knows he got a lot of people behind him and uh, other people might have some type of, if he got a big family, other people might have some type of affinity for him. And so if that would have happened, that would have caused a huge stir in Medina, right? So the Prophet Wasallam said, now, now look at them. And he said, now think about it. If I asked them to kill him, the same people who would have protected him, it said they would have did so on their own free will. Now he's totally exposed. Now everybody is looking at him. They disgusted at him. And it's like his stuff is totally exposed now. And Umar replied, I swear by Allah, that the Prophet Sallallahu judgment is more sound than mine. And so he saw the hikmah, the wisdom behind what the Prophet Sallallahu had did and did not allow him to do. And so Alhamdulillah, we'll stop there. And um, inshallah, the floor is open for um, any um, questions, inshallah. No questions on Facebook. One of the, oh, wait a minute, up my sound. Can you guys, oh, you can still hear me? Okay, I was going to another mic. Ugh, I got three mics. I don't know which one I'm talking through. Okay, sister wants to know, she said, so can you elaborate more on Ali and why he didn't support Aisha? Well, it wasn't necessarily, his whole thing was that if she's innocent or if she's guilty, it's almost like one of those things you know, you 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 stressed out about this situation, Messenger of Allah. You know, just you can divorce her, and that way you don't have to worry about if she was innocent or guilty. That's 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 where he that's what he was saying. So he was saying he doesn't know if she, if she innocent, he don't know if she guilty. But you basically you causing yourself this mental anguish, and you the Messenger of Allah, and she could you could you can marry anybody would want to marry you. That's what he was coming with. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of people. In this day and age, if they had the same situation, may have said the same exact thing. But she was in, she was innocent and she never forgot about that particular um, that statement that was made. 
You know, so it wasn't a, a thing like he hated her. It wasn't a thing of his thing was more so I, he loved the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa more than anything. So he hated to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa going through anything. And his thing was like, you can, if, if it is, if it's not, you know, you don't have to deal with this. You could, there's one way you could deal with it, not be bothered with it at all. And that, that was where his mindset was, you know, so it wasn't a thing of that he hated her or, you know, had anything personally against her. He loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he didn't want to see any type of um, issues that he was going through as a result of this situation. Anything else? Okay, Zoom, you guys can go ahead, inshallah. Uh oh, um, I, I, I hope oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just had a question on um, can you repeat um, the brother's name that got tied up in the masjid? Um, his name? His name was Thumama. Hold on, let Thumama. me, um, yeah, let me give you, let's give you the whole thing. Okay, his name was Thumama uh, um, Ben Uthal El Hanafi. It's spelled T H U M A M A H, then B I N, and then U T H A L, A, and then, you know, space, and then A L, and then another space, H A N A F I, Hanafi. And he, okay. was from and Banu, question, he was from Banu Hanifa. Okay. My question with him is um, they tied him up, but was like, because um, I think I remember hearing his name um, mm -hmm. as he gave up for um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing me up on him to get a, to when it was like saying, you can offer me money or offer my um, people money and they will um, like um, give him a ward or whatever if they let him go. Was that the same person or was if, there was I, a couple? People. Yeah, there was a. I'm not for sure if that was him because there was a couple people they did that to, you know. And and like I said, the 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 beauty the, the strategy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was for for people to see. And remember, he's a he's a chief of his tribe. So what would happen is that when a chief accepted Islam. 99% of the time, the vast majority of all of the other people from under him accepted Islam. They rolled like that. You know, so it's like if he can, so he comes in there and he's got, um, he's got the power where he actually basically did an a, a economic sanctions on the Meccans, you know, in terms of grain and that kind of thing. Because when people come in and trade it, they had to go through these places. So if they find out like, look, where are you going? Oh, man, we get ready to go to Mecca. No, you're not. You ain't about to go to Mecca. You could take that stuff and take it right back. Or if they were the ones who were the suppliers of grain, they weren't going to do any business with them. But there was a couple people that I know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that to. You know what I mean? But he's basically asking him for mercy. You know, and this statement that he's making, he's asking for mercy. Don't kill him. You know what I'm saying? In terms of being gracious to him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he let him go. And, uh, and he wanted to make sure that he wasn't saying anything that when he accepted Islam, it wasn't under the guise of him being tied up. He wanted to make sure that he was free to go. He said he took a bath and he came back and accepted this. And he came right back and accepted Islam. You know, alhamdulillah. So that was, um, but as far as what you're saying, I'm not for sure if this is the brother. It may have been somebody else um, uh, in that situation. But I know that they've done that a couple, to a couple people that, that, that happened to them. Okay, because yeah, the reason why I mentioned that was because um, after all, he he um, took a shahada. Like it, the story is kind of like uh, familiar, like what you said, how he was leaving, and then he mm -hmm. took a shahada, and so that's why I wanted to know what was his name because I kind of remember that story like that. So that's why I wasn't for sure what his name was. Yeah, you know what happened too. Um, Khalid's brother Walid ibn uh, Walid, he did the same thing. He was captured in the Battle of Badr. 
And he wanted to, he was, he was chained up and he saw how the Muslims interacted with each other, how the Muslims were giving them like the best of their food in terms of dates and bread and that kind of thing. Because prisoners of wars used to be dogged out. They would dog them out. They might go in there and kick them and punch them in the face. And, you know, all kind of the Muslims didn't do that. So he observed the, the etiquette of the Muslims. He observed their, their etiquette. And he actually had his brother, Khalid, come and free him. You know, they were paying ransoms for them uh, to, to come out. And he actually want, he waited to his brother, freed him, paid his ransom. And then he went back. He left. And then he went back into Medina and he had accepted Islam too. You know, I mean, so that was, uh, that it was several situations like that. You know, it was several situations like that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for straining out. I just wanted to see, was that the same person? Cause I remember the story and I just wanted to clarify it. And also my second question was, when um, I like how you explained it, because like how you broke it down when you said um, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace and bless me up on him, had married uh, Zainab of how yeah. it was like how you broke it down, like far as in like the bloods and the crypts, but just trying to everyone has something to lose if they got together just to uh, make the peace. So I like how you broke that down. I just wanted to let you know um, the not? whole story, the whole, everything you say, but I'm just saying I, I like how you break it down because my understanding is different than how you stop and you explain it a little bit better. Then you be like, oh, okay, okay. So I just wanted to make sure. Right. You know, yeah. I know that we can relate to that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I know you can relate. So if, if family and subhanAllah, I know of communities, um, I know of communities or whatever that have gotten stronger together because of their one, one person uh, and family. Somebody come from a big Muslim family in one community. And then another will come from a big Muslim or a Muslim family in another community and say from New York and one is from Cleveland. And now those communities is like this with each other now based on that marriage, you know, based on based on that marriage or whatever. So these things definitely. And, you know, what you got to remember something, too, in a remarkable this is only you know that this is that Islam is from Allah because the Prophet وسلم, was only around in terms of teaching. Pre, I mean, given Dawah, these verses from the Quran for 23 years. You know how short that America been around for over 200 and they still ain't got it together. And it's all these other. So imagine you change the whole course of thinking, believing um, traditions in the course of 23 years of people who have been doing something for 500 years, 300 years, 100 years. They have been doing and Islam changed that whole mindset. And so only something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that. You know, so, yeah, I try to use examples that we can relate to. <laughs> Mashallah, <laughs> thank you very much. And I'll also I had this is my last question. Um, mm -hmm. um, I had heard about the story, like as far as in um, with Aisha, but the way how you broke it down, it's like it seemed like. It's, it, I don't know why people will, people always leave out the little bitty, little emphasis, like, like, why did you guys say that? Like, when you said that she was looking for a necklace and she got left behind, like, yeah. no, I never heard that before. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's just like some of the things that when people tell a story, they leave out different things. So I just want to. Yeah, that's an important that. part of the puzzle. You're like, how did she get, how did that happen? No, she lost, she lost the necklace. And it was and she was bent on finding it because it wasn't hers. It was loaned to her. So, you know, they had that type of um, they had that type of uh, honor. You know, some people like, hey, I, I lost it. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> now, they didn't they didn't have that type of behavior. They didn't have that type of mindset, you know, so she lost it. And that's how, you know, she lost it. And far, next thing you know, they was gone. And, you know, they thought they had her and. Yeah, that's how that, that happened. No, that's a very important piece of the puzzle. You know, if people leave that part out. So, alhamdulillah. Any Thank other, you. um, oh, oh, you're welcome. Any other questions or comments? As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, I had never heard the phrase before or play, if it is considered a phrase, uh, Apostasy wars. Uh huh. I had never. Could you define that? 
Uh, okay. never heard it before. So an, an Arabic is known as the Ridda, R-I-D-A, Ridda Wars. So basically what happens is that after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu a lot of people were starting to leave Islam because they figured that the Prophet Sallallahu was dead. That means Islam was gone. And even to the point where certain agreements that they had made, they figured, and Zakah was a big one. That was the main thing. They said, listen, We'll pray, but we're not paying no zakah. We're not doing that. We only we pray. We so there was a lot of different reasons, a uh, slick reasons as to what they came up with as to why that they weren't going to pay the zakah. We made a we uh we made a a, a pact with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So since he's dead, we're not held to that anymore. You know we uh you know or, or we just not paying it. And we don't believe in this stuff no more. We're not paying it. So under the leadership of Abu Bakr, these, this is known as the apostasy wars, where people, these uh, tribes were leaving Islam and um, are rebellious against Islam. And it was told that basically we don't make any distinction between zakah and salah. Salah and zakah are coupled together in the Quran at least 83 times, if I'm not mistaken. So... Uh, Abu Bakr said that if they withhold a rope that they used to give the messenger of Allah, I'm going to fight them. And this was very controversial because these were people, this is a situation that they had ne never had to deal with when the Prophet Wasallam was around because these were people who had professed to be Muslim. And so Abu Bakr is like, no, 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 we got to deal with this. And Omar ibn al-Khattab, a lot of other Sahaba is like, no, they, they, they Muslim. You know, we got to find another way to deal with this. And Abu Bakr was absolutely right because now it's rebellion against the state. And where does it stop? OK, so if you let them get away with, with not paying zakah, now it's like, you know what? Well, I think we're not we're not uh, making Salat no more. We're not going to do that. We're not going to pray. We're not going to have a masjid in our place. We're going to go back to doing um. Uh, 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 idols. So where does it stop? So Abu Bakr was tasked with making sure that things stayed exactly the same way that Allah and his messenger had it. And so <clears throat> that's what the apostasy wars were. So Muslims were engaged in these fights with these different um, tribes and a lot of them ended up repenting and coming back to Islam and the most famous of the apostasy battle was against Musaylam the liar. This was somebody he had thousands of troops and a lot of good Muslims got killed. And this is actually what led to the Quran by Zayd ibn Thabit um, being tasked with putting the Quran in a book form. Yeah, because a lot of the memor memorizers of the Quran was getting killed in these wars. So this is something that um, it, it was not something that was light. You know, a lot of Muslims died fighting in these uh, apostasy wars. You know what I'm saying? So that's basically what that was about. It was about Muslim people who had accepted Islam and that there were certain parts of Islam that they refused to practice. And as a result of that, that made them because, see, brothers and sisters in Islam, this is one thing. It's one thing if you say it's one thing if you don't pray. And that's a, a major sin. It's one thing if you don't pay zakah. That's a major sin. You still are not, uh, if you prayed every other, you prayed sometimes and sometimes you didn't, you know, that's a, that's a major sin. Um, if you stop praying altogether and you, and you refuse to pay zakah and say, I don't have to pay zakah. I don't have to pray. Now you are on the outskirts of, you on the outside of Islam. So if you make those types of statements and you live by them, now you're not in the, in, the, in the fold of Islam, and now it becomes an issue. If you are in the Islamic state, and that's what Abu Bakr did, Abu Bakr dealt with that situation um, immediately because he understood the problem that was getting ready to ensue if he didn't um, deal with that, that problem immediately. And alhamdulillah, a great number of them repented, and they ended up coming back to Islam. And if it was not for the... Um, the uh, the, uh, the the way that Abu Bakr dealt with that, then Alhamdulillah, we don't know what would have happened. But Alhamdulillah, he dealt with it correctly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him 
Um, and didn't the fact that they said that they were Muslim, that didn't stop him from going and doing what he needed to do. And alhamdulillah, every, everything is okay now. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Jazakallah, Kier. Barakallah, Feet. Alhamdulillah. Okay, any other questions? Any more qu any questions on Facebook? Test my, my mic. You guys can hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. new yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, I hear you. Okay, yeah, because I'm using a new mic. Okay, the brother wants to know, same brother, he wants to know, so is this what led to the dissension between Aisha and Ali? She never forgave him. I don't know why this brother won't get off of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean... But yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've read sources about that. Yeah, I mean... As Muslims, this is known as the Battle of Siffin. And as, as a lot of scholars don't necessarily encourage us to go in about that because there were Sahabas that were fighting each other. And then what they don't want us to do is pick sides against the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, it was an incident. It was an unfortunate incident. And it, it serves as a reminder and a lesson for us that we have to be cautious and not... Um, and, and, and love one another and try to resolve our issues with each other as best as we can. That, so that, I mean, that just serves as a purpose for that. But I've, I've read the, those statements that this is something that she did hold on to um, when he was talking, when they had appointed him to Caliph. And um, this was an issue that she, that she had. He said, thanks, because now he said he know he don't want the details, but now it makes sense. He said, mm -hmm. he said, it's just, he said, thank you for this. Like the other sister said, because now it makes sense why she did what she did. She was holding on. He said, thank yeah. you. Cause that's I'm one part right. he never understood and never could get anyone to explain, but thank you. He said, thank I'm you. Right. You're welcome. Is sister Bethany on, on here. Yeah, she's in there. She's quiet. Okay, she's I'm here. <laughs> Her and uh, right, Elizabeth, I'm doing Elizabeth, Bethany, and all the they they even got us in a new revert group, a convert group. I and mean, we in two groups now. Or three. I'm doing <laughs> so, I, 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 I hope I, I hope she's inching closer and closer about the love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <laughs> she said she's typing now. She said yes. She said this is her favorite class. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. He says she still yeah, we, loves Jesus, but she's loving the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, as she says, she's growing in her love for him too. And he, love. We love him too. We love Jesus too. Aisha, she, says she likes Aisha too. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Now we love Prophet Isa Alaihi Salam too. You know what I'm saying? But Alhamdulillah. So yes, yeah, so Inshallah. Any um any other questions? Uh, anybody got any other questions? Inshallah, before we close out. Okay, alhamdulillah. So we are close. We we end we we uh we nearing um towards the end. We're about two thirds done with the the um with this particular book. You know what I'm saying? So alhamdulillah. Um and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may Allah bless us to be together next week. And if anybody got any get thing good from this, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if any bad or any mistakes that was made, it's on me. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide me and, and, uh, and forgive me. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa ashadu an la ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.